me, Michael F. White, and she will start our session, Plant-Based Power Hour, Healthy Lunch Meal Prep. Thanks, Stephanie. Awesome. Thank you so much, Molly. Hi, everyone. Uh, happy Wednesday. Happy World Teachers Day. Happy Yom Kippur. There's a lot going on today. So uh, if you have questions at any point in time, just like Molly said, please feel free to put it in the chat uh, and we'll happily try to get to everything. Molly already spent tons of time uh, kind of detailing my background. So I figured we would jump right in into making a beautiful fall inspired whole grain bowl. Uh, and the base we're going to use today is Faro, but um, y'all are going to get a printout or a, a resource with sort of a roadmap for the different components because when we're thinking about healthy meal prep in general, particularly plant-based, a lot of items can be mixed and matched. And it's a really great way to keep lunch or dinner exciting without feeling like you're eating the same thing over and over again. So today we're using farro, but you could use the same technique for other grains like uh, whole, whole grains like quinoa, or you could use brown rice, tons of options there. And I see Ashley already put the uh, print down in the chat. Thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, and if anybody has questions about that as well, please feel free to uh, type it in the chat while we're here. So what we're going to do first is I wanted to talk through kind of my setup because whenever we're thinking about sort of uh, prepping anything healthy or prepping anything in a kitchen, we wanna have a beautiful setup so that we can work efficiently, effectively, and safely. So you'll notice here that I have a cutting board and my chef's knife ready to go. You also may notice some items on the side. And what I have here is my equipment as well as my veggies that I'm going to prep. And what we call that in culinary arts is mise en place, which is a French term for everything in its place. Now, everything in its place, a lot of times people will think about from a you know, food prep standpoint. So having all of your ingredients prep, chop, ready to go before we start cooking, but I also like to think about it mentally as well. So whenever we're cooking, we wanna be present, we wanna be in the process as well. So I like to think about it as mental mise en place as well as physical mise en place. The other thing that I have going on here today is I've got my oven preheated because we're gonna roast some beautiful sweet potatoes. And because it's gonna take quite a while, I kind of sped up that process a little bit and did a little mise. So I have some of my sweet potatoes already cut and I keep the skin on it for some extra fiber. Uh, I like the texture of it, but some people don't particularly care for the skin on root veggies like sweet potatoes or beets. So you can certainly peel that off as well. So we've got that oven free to 375. And when we're thinking about whole grain bowls, um, uh, we've got a bunch of different veggies here today, uh, sweet potatoes, beets. I've got some beet greens as well, since I bought the beets with the bunch. Uh, so I'm going to use as much as I can so that we're not having any food waste. Uh, but when you're thinking about these whole grain bowls, you can really mix and match veggies depending on the season and also depending on what you like, right? So we're just hitting fall. So that's why I'm using a lot of root veggies just to kind of celebrate that. Um, but during the summer, you could do a very similar dish, but switch out those veggies for things like uh, fresh tomatoes and cucumber, really bring in that vibrancy of the season. That way we have beautiful nutrient density as well. Uh, also, I realize that I'm an East Coaster and I tend to speak pretty quickly. So if anybody at any point in time uh, feels that I'm speaking too quickly, please put that in the chat too and I can slow my roll just a little bit. So uh, for roasting the sweet potatoes, I've got a sheet tray and some foil. You could also use parchment. And I'm just going to place it here on the side of my cutting board. But what I'm going to do is toss my cut sweet potatoes with a little bit of olive oil, just a little bit, just to coat it. Uh, so that's nice and shiny and it helps transfer the heat as well as some kosher salt. I will not be using all of this. I just like to have a little bowl to pinch and I'm gonna bring in some ground cinnamon, just bring in some earthy flavors and bring some additional flavors into this dish. So you could put your sweet potatoes directly on the sheet tray and then drizzle. But what I like to do, uh, since I've already got it cut into a bowl is I'm just gonna drizzle a little bit of that oil into the container along with some of my cinnamon. Now, most people have their ground spices still in the container. It's absolutely fine. Um, I like to, again, knees it out a little bit in advance. That way too, I don't accidentally dump too, too much cinnamon into my sweet potato. So less is more sometimes. So from here, just pinching a little bit of salt in there and I'm gonna put my lid on it and just shake it up. That way it gets evenly coated. Sometimes if I'm doing a big batch, I'll also put it into a bowl as well. But since I've got this small, 
pretty much one to two person batch of sweet potatoes. It's easier just to use the container that I've already, that I already need to wash. So from here, I'm going to place my sweet potatoes on my tray and I'm going to spread them out just a little bit so that they don't kind of crowd because what happens when we're roasting it, any veggies have, you know, water content in it. And what happens when you have them crowded in one spot, they can get kind of mushy and not get that beautiful golden brown color that we're looking for. So we want to give them space on that sheet tray. And I'm going to place it into my oven that's been preheated. And they're gonna take about 30-ish minutes. It really depends on the size of your cut. So that's why I've also got it a little small so that we have plenty of time to actually serve our sweet potatoes today. Uh, but it's really important to consider when we're making whole grain bowls or really anything in the kitchen, uh, you know, we might not have the time to cook everything every day all at once, right? So what can be really helpful is at the beginning of your week, plan out your meals. And then from there, you can pre-cook some of your items. So you could do a huge batch of sweet potatoes, maybe some butternut squash, roast it all off. And then once it's nice and tender, golden brown, take it out of the oven, allow it to cool. And then you can put it into airtight containers. I always like to label and date it since I'm a professional chef and we also like to know when we prepared something so that's still safe to eat. From there though, you can keep it in your fridge and you can use it for multiple different meals. So you already have that prepped out. A lot of times that can make life a lot easier, just like Sydney put in the chat. Meal prepping is super fun and it definitely makes life a lot easier. Uh, initially though, if you have some hesitancies about meal prepping, uh, it does sometimes take quite a long time and we're gonna go through some knife skills kind of 101 because it's really important that we stay safe. But the more you practice this, the faster you're going to get at it. First couple times though, for sure, it may take a little bit longer than you're anticipating. So always give yourself some time to prep and have that space. So we've got the sweet potatoes cooking. From here, what we're going to do is cook our farro from scratch. So I've already got my farro portioned out. You gotta love the little portions. But uh, for those of y'all who haven't seen farro, I'm local. I got it at Kroger, totally fine. Uh, but it comes in containers like this. You may see it in the bulk section as well for different places. There's a really hearty uh, grain. I love it, but if you're gluten-free, I would recommend a different grain since that is wheat-based, okay? So what we're going to do today to the farro is we are going to make a pilaf style. You could also, with your whole grains, just boil it kind of like making pasta, add a little bit of salt to the water, and then cook it until it's tender and drain off any excess liquid. But with the pilaf method, what we do is we start it with I like to start it with, honestly, a little bit of onion. We're gonna cut the onion together. And then from there, we sweat the onion until it's soft and translucent. Add in our grains. You can also add in some beautiful spices, bring in the liquid and bring it up to a boil and cover it. And that way you can have some beautifully tender grains, but also infuse a little bit more flavor. And this is also something just like those sweet potatoes, you could do in a large batch over the weekend or when you have time and then use it for multiple meals throughout the week. So to start our peel off, we need to dice this onion because I'm certainly not putting this whole onion into, into the peel off. So uh, I've already peeled the exterior skin a little bit, but what I'm going to do is take the top and the bottom off and then we're going to dice it. Uh, first things first though, with my cutting board, super important whenever you're meal prepping, some cutting boards tend to slip. So a chef trick is to put a wet paper towel right underneath it. That way your cutting board is not gonna move around because we wanna be safe, right? So we're gonna dice this onion. So when we're thinking about the knife grab, I'm going to hold my knife with my thumb and my forefinger. So I'm gonna pinch right between the blade and the handle and I'm gonna wrap my hands around the handle. This way I have total control of the knife. And this way too, when I'm cutting, I have a really good motion and dexterity with it. If you're holding it back like this, you're not gonna have too much control. And if you're holding it up like that, it certainly, it looks goofy, it feels goofy, and you won't really have total movement of that knife, right? So um, pinch and wrap your hands around. Now, the other really important thing is what you're doing with the other hand while you're cutting, right? We wouldn't wanna chop around like that. So it's really important that we use something called the claw grip. So the claw grip, it'll almost look like a, a paw or a claw. So you tuck your fingers back and when you're cutting, you're gonna have your knuckles right up against the knife like that and thumb tuck back. Some people let it hang loose and we don't want that because it could potentially hang loose, right? So 
have your knuckles right up against that knife. And as you're cutting, you're going to use a gliding motion. So you never pick the knife up and you're not chopping like this, but you know exactly where your fingers are. They know exactly where the knife is. That may feel really awkward and weird, particularly if you haven't done it before. So take the time and take that practice. So from here, top and bottom, and these are trimmings. You could keep it for veggie stock. What I like to do if I'm prepping throughout the week is I put all of my kind of veggie scraps into a container like this, put it in my refrigerator. And then as it kind of accumulates throughout the week, I make veggie stock the next weekend. You can also put it in the freezer if you don't plan on making stock that frequently or plan on cooking that frequently, but it's a really great way to minimize food waste and also get another use out of your trims. So we've got the top and bottom off of our onion. You can also see we have a beautiful flat surface now, so we don't have an onion rolling around like that because it's stained for us, right? So we've got the bottom side that has the root end still kind of intact. So we're going to cut that in half. Now from here, we're only going to need one half. So I'm just gonna tuck the other half to the side. We can see we have a nice secure flat surface for our onion. From here, we're gonna dice it and you can see this end still has the root on it. So we're gonna keep the root away and we're going to cut into the other side. So I'm gonna adjust my camera so you can see my cutting board just a little bit more. And we're really gonna use mostly the tip of the knife. And we're gonna cut through the onion so that essentially what we're doing is making little pieces that come apart like that. So it'll almost look like an accordion at the end of it. But what we're going to do is cut it vertically and then cut it horizontally so that we can get this beautiful grid shape. And then we have even nicely perfect dices. So from here, I can use that kind of ridge line of my onion and cut straight down. So you can see here from the side, you can almost see how mostly consistent they are. I have one that's a little slightly angled, but it's coming apart, but we didn't cut all the way through from that root end so that it stays intact. So we don't have uh, the onion confetti. So. From here, once we have those vertical lines, we're gonna place our hand flat on the top. We don't wanna curve it around because what we're going to do is cut horizontally. So you wanna think about keeping a flat surface like this, you have straight lines, and that way you don't accidentally cut up into your hand. Now this can feel kind of dangerous, so take your time with it. But we're just going to glide our knife through about three quarters of the onion. And from here, some of the pieces may fall out, but from the side, you can see it almost looks like wrap paper. So once we have that done, we're going to use that claw grip and cut straight through. And essentially you just need to cut to where those vertical lines stop. You can continue to cut it, or you can use this as scraps. This is a lot of onion to um, just totally scrap. So from here, what I could do is cut lines into it or cut those vertical lines and then continue to chop really close to that core. This is plenty for the peel off that we're making, uh, but you can see here that we have some relatively consistent onion pieces. And I'd love to see in the chat, why do we wanna make sure that our cuts are nice and consistent? What do y'all think the, the purpose of that is? And while everybody is typing, I love it. The uniform cooking looks better, cooks most evenly, evenly. I love it, same cooking time, absolutely taste. I like it, so texture. So that cooking even time, visual as well as texture. So I love it. So what we're going to do from here is we're gonna take our pot and I'm gonna add a little bit of oil to the bottom of this pot just to coat the bottom of the surface. We don't wanna to use too much, but we wanna help conduct that heat and transfer the heat between the cooking surface and then into the veggie. So I'm going to turn that up to about medium, medium low heat. We wanna get that oil nice and hot. Uh, and then from there, we're going to sweat our onions just until they're soft and translucent, add in our farro, and then from there, bring in the liquid, bring it up to a simmer and get it beautifully nice and tender. Uh, and some people are talking about the onion uniformity. It definitely takes practice. I have cut many, many onions in my life. All right, and Tiffany just asked how much oil so I'm going off visual. So about two teaspoons for the amount that I'm making. 
see if I can get my lighting in there. So just a very, very small amount, just so that the bottom of the pan has a nice even sheen, okay? Now, if you're making a larger batch, you can add in more liquid, more oil. Uh, that being said, we just don't want to have too much because we certainly don't want to fry our onions or fry our farro before we start to cook it. So perfect. Um, really important thing too, when you're following recipes, if you're a recipe follower, when you think about a tablespoon versus two tablespoons of olive oil can make or break a recipe sometimes. So I kind of go by eye, uh, but always if you're really trying to be particular about especially the caloric content of your recipes to measure things out to adjust it from there. Yes, and the, the oil bottles definitely are, are deceiving. I <laughs> love that point. So what I'm going to do is I'm taking my onion and I'm just sliding it into a container. You probably think I'm throwing my onion on the floor. <laughs> I just want to move it to a container so that as the oil heats up, I can add in my, my onion. Another important thing when we're thinking about meal prep uh, and knife work like this, Maybe we want it to dice all of our onion and then we can use those diced onions in multiple different recipes. So just, uh, you know, you can bulk prep, which can really cut down on the cooking time after, after work or if you have the luxury of cooking midway through the day too. So, so our oil is moving around pretty freely. So what I, move by, I mean by freely is when you look at the oil, see if we can get this on camera. So it'll slide around pretty fast in the pan once it starts to get hot. You can also feel it by your hand like this. Certainly don't want to touch the oil. So I'm going to add in my onion. And the other indicator using all of our senses is I can hear it start to sizzle, which is a good sign. So I'm going to add in a pinch of salt. Stir that around. And I'm going to reduce the heat just a little bit so we don't accidentally get tons of color on our onions. Reduce it a little bit more. You can really start to hear it. And we really wanna sweat it just until it's soft and translucent. So I'm actually gonna put a lid on it, kind of speed up the process a little bit. And in the meantime, while we're making that beautiful peel off, we're gonna prep some more veggies. So some of the other items we're gonna to use today, I have beet greens, they're starting to get a little wilted in the heat of my kitchen. Uh, if you don't have beet greens, because it's not that common, um, I, I have them because I bought beets in a bunch and then I roasted my beets in advance since I don't think any of y'all wanted to hang around with me for an hour and a half while these got nice and tender. But I love using the greens because they're beautiful and vibrant, full of nutrients. And I also like to minimize food waste. So if you don't have beet greens during the fall, kale is beautiful as well, or Swiss chard. Uh, you could even do collards. So really tons of options when it comes to your greens. So what we're gonna do is just chop these so that we have it ready to go for a whole grain bowl. And you can see that they have pretty long stems. Now the stems you can actually use too, but we certainly wanna cut them small so we don't accidentally have lengthy pieces of beet greens or beet stems. So what you can do, and this goes for other greens as well, particularly like kale that has a hardier stem, you can make essentially like an okay sign. And then from here, kind of pinch right between where the greens meet the stem, hold onto the stem and pull. That way you can remove it pretty quickly from the stem. We just got a question, another submitted question. Will the olive, uh, will the oil move the same way in stainless steel? Yes. Uh, depending on the type of pot that you're using, uh, heat transfer can take more or less time, but otherwise it will move freely the same way and other types of pots. It's an excellent question. Thank you, Ashley, for putting that in the chat. So before we get too far away from our onions and I accidentally burn them on us. <laughs> so we're starting to see, they're starting to get soft and translucent. We can start to smell them as well. When we're thinking about cooking, it's a full sensory experience. So that's also a really great time to really enjoy what you're doing and really get into the cooking process. So we're gonna let those switch just for a little bit longer while I remove the stems from my greens. And at this point, we're gonna add in our farro. I've got about three quarters of a cup here. You can absolutely do more. Uh, Tiffany just asked, what temp do you heat the oil on? Uh, so medium low. With uh, trying to sweat them, we don't wanna get any color on it. And when you have the heat too high, it has a propensity to start to caramelize before it gets nice and soft and translucent. So turn down your heat at this point. So from here, adding that in, 
And what I'm doing with the peel off method is essentially I'm coating the exterior of the fair with a little bit of oil, which helps kind of protect the shape of it so that when we cook it with the liquid, they stay nice and individual because we certainly don't want a sticky mess of grains. So from here, once it's coated in that oil, I'm just using water today, but if you have veggie stock on hand, you can absolutely do that. Now with farro, the, the liquid to grain ratio is about two to two and a half cups. So for a cup of farro, we're looking at two to two and a half cups of liquid. Uh, and that ratio really depends on the grain that you're using. So from here, I'm going to add that in and I'm going to allow that to come up to a simmer. We're gonna turn down the heat and put the lid on it and cook it for about 15 minutes. And that cooking time on the grains. Now, Sydney asked tips to prevent your eyes from watering when cutting onions. It's an excellent question. So key tip, make sure your knife is sharp. Having a sharp knife helps cut through the cellular structure of your onion. The other thing that works for some people is refrigerating your onions. Please don't freeze them because then the cell structure will burst and you'll have mushy onion, but refrigerating it can sometimes help subdue that reaction. So I do hope that helps. So when we're taking a look at our beets, beet greens that we just so nicely removed from the stems, I'm gonna stack them up and kind of fold them. That way I can cut more than one at a time. So from here, I'm gonna move the stems just to the side for now. And what I'm going to do is just make thin strips. Now, classically, this uh, is called a chiffonade if we did it super, super fine. I like to leave my grains a little bit larger, particularly with the grain bowl because I like the texture. But you know, when you're prepping your own food, it's, it's up to you to decide what size you wanna make everything. So I've got that claw grip, and this is where you're going to see that rocking motion. So I'm gliding back and forth, and I'm moving my hand along with the greens. So we can see here that we have beautiful ribbons of our beet greens. And I'm gonna put that in my container just so we can get it off the cutting board. And I'm still going to use these beet stems, but I wanna cut them a little bit finer so we don't have long strips of beet stems. And I'm gonna check out our water coming up to simmer shortly. So from here, I'm gonna cut on a bias. What that means is just, I'm gonna cut on a slight angle just to give it some visual contrast. So I've got that bundle again, and I'm using that claw grip, but what I'm going to do is cut on a 45 degree angle. Now, as you can see, I'm looking up at the camera right now. Please don't do that while you're, <laughs> you're prepping your own food. Wanna make sure you know exactly where your fingers are. So. From here, you can see that we have our beet stems kind of cut on a cute little bias. So I'm gonna push that into my container as well. And from here, we're also gonna prep some scallions. I just like to bring in some fresh herbs to my whole grain bowls just to bring in some pop of, of uh, that herbaceousness. So from here, we're gonna take off those roots. Roots on scallions you could absolutely keep and use in your veggie stock as well. Pretty much any veggie goes for veggie stock, but you do want to stay away from super starchy things like potatoes because it's going to make the water quite starchy, kind of give a bitter off flavor as well. Also, any very, very green veggies like broccoli stems, you can get away with one or two, but you certainly don't want to make just a broccoli stock unless you're making broccoli soup because it's going to be very intense in that flavor. So I can hear the water coming up to a boil. So I'm going to put my lid on, turn it down to low, and I'm just going to put a timer on so that we can talk and do other things and not have to worry. So even chefs use timers, I highly recommend them. <laughs> so from here with our scallions, similarly to that bias cut on the beet stems, I'm going to do that for the scallions. Now, some people find that the white part of the beet or of the scallion is a little too intense for them. So what I would recommend is you could use the whites in cooking. So just like an onion, and then use the greens for uh, garnishing or for putting into salads and keeping it fresh. Uh, and I just got a question, how long does the farro cook? So for about 15 minutes. So depending on the grain that you're choosing is really going to change the cook time as well. So things like brown rice tend to take a lot longer, where farro, quinoa tend to take around 12 to 15 minutes. That's a great question. So uh, if you don't know the cook time on your grains, 
you can. Most packaging actually has it on the back side. They know what they're talking about, um, but there's plenty of resources online as well. So from here, we're gonna cut this on that bias. So you can see actually that rocking motion a little bit more from this angle as well. So this is preventing the knife from picking up off of the cutting board so that I can have my fingers right next to it without fear of accidentally cutting my hand. All right. It's pretty quick and efficient, but I've also been doing this for a while, so take your time. <laughs> So I'm gonna put those with my beet greens. And from here, so we've got our beet greens, we've got our scallions. I've got some beets that we're going to cut up for our whole grain bowl. I also have some chickpeas. I will not be using all of the chickpeas, but they are cooked, ready to go. Uh, you can use canned. Key thing with the canned is you wanna make sure to rinse them as well. Uh, Cause there's a lot of that, that liquid from the container that tends to have a lot of salt in it. And you don't really want that lingering flavor nor do you want that liquid. Uh, you can also buy beans dried, soak them overnight or hot soak them. So soak them in, in warm water for about 45 minutes to an hour, drain out that liquid and then cook it in just a big pot of water. Make sure it's really covered uh, with tons of water and then gently, gently cook it until they're nice and tender. Depending on the bean that you're using can really vary the cooking time as well, but you can do big batches. And candidly, from a cost perspective, the dried beans go a lot longer for your money. So I have those cooked and just set to the side. Some of our other components, I have some toasted walnuts and I toasted those walnuts on a sheet tray. So similarly to the sweet potatoes, you could do a large batch on a sheet tray rather than toasting it on the stove where you do a small amount. Uh, and that way too, you get a very nice consistent roast on it. So before we totally get into prepping the rest of our items for the top of our whole grain bowl, I'm going to check in on our sweet potatoes, see how they're doing. All right. So at the stage where it's starting to get some beautiful color on it, and because I cut them quite small, they're already starting to get tender, but they go for a little bit longer. So we're gonna pop them back in the oven. So getting back to the beets really quick. When we have our beets already roasted, so all I did was took my whole beets, I washed them, and then from there I wrapped them in foil. You could also do parchment if you don't like foil. And then I just roasted it at 325 for about an hour. Depending on how big your beets are can really impact that size or that cook time as well. So with our beets, I've already peeled them, but as you can see, there's plenty of beet liquid in here and it will stay in your hands. It's gonna stay in my cutting board, it's gonna be a fun mess. So you can see here that they're nice and tender and I'm already wearing single use gloves. So the reason why I'm wearing single use gloves is A, to avoid some staining, but it's also ready to eat. So technically pretty much all of our whole grain bowl is ready to eat. So when you're preparing foods for other people, highly recommend single use gloves as well as hand washing practices as well. Um, you know, when you're cooking it for yourself, not as much of a big deal, but the hand washing is definitely a big deal. Uh, and then we just got the question, do golden beets work in this recipe too? Absolutely. Pretty much any veggie goes for this recipe. These are just the ones that I chose for the day. So from here, since it's already been peeled, and you can eat the peel of beets too, it just tends to be quite um, soily almost. It's got that flavor. Uh, not everybody likes it. I don't mind it, but um, the texture is not always uh, favorable for a lot of people as well. So from here, I'm cutting it in half. So whenever you're thinking about a round object, we wanna create a flat surface so it doesn't roll around on us. So at this point, you could dice it into cubes or what you can do is make little wedges. I like the wedges because it reminds me of the shape of the actual beet. And that's the beautiful thing about prepping your own food is you can cut it, slice and dice it the way you want the food. So we've got our beets wedged, ready to go. I'm gonna place it back in my container. And while everything is finishing up on the stove and in the oven, we're gonna make a tahini dressing really quickly and then we'll plate everything and we'll see where we land, right? So I've got a small container for our dressing and I'm gonna make a tahini dressing today. So tahini is sesame seed paste. It's kind of like peanut butter, but with sesame instead of peanuts. The other big thing is that there are no added other ingredients. So it's really just sesame seeds that have been ground into a paste 
And that's the oil that's naturally found in the sesame seeds. So I'm just opening it for the first time. After you open it, I highly recommend putting it in a refrigerator. But you can see that we've got this distribution of the fat. So I'm gonna take a spoon and I'm gonna mix that in so that we have that beautiful tahini paste mixed together. Now, what we're gonna do for this dressing is I'm simply going to add in some lemon zest and lemon juice and season with a little bit of salt. Um, but you could absolutely add in some minced garlic as well. If you like things a little bit sweeter, you could certainly also use a little bit of maple syrup or agave. I just tend to, I like the natural sweetness from the sweet potatoes and the beets in this dish. So I don't really need it in my dressing. So for my lemon, we're going to zest it first. And I'm gonna make my dressing just in this container, something simple, easy, and I'm gonna get my cutting board out of the way. And that's the great thing of prepping in advance is you can kind of clean up as you go too. So I've got a little microplane, a little zester. And the way I like to zest is I place the zester right over wherever I want the zest to go. And what I'm doing is with my lemon or if you had a lime or a grapefruit, basically I'm coming down straight using a little bit of pressure and rotating that citrus. So I'm not accidentally grinding into the pith, which can be quite bitter. And I love lemon. So I'm going to use all of that zest. We tap that in and we're just gonna cut the lemon in half. I'm actually gonna use my cutting board, so shame on me for moving it too quickly, but I'm just going to cut it in half. And from here, I'm gonna start with about half of my lemon because it's always easier to add in than take away, right? So I'm gonna squeeze it over the zester. And the reason why I'm doing that is so that if any of the seeds come out of the lemon, it's hitting the zester instead of accidentally ending up in the container. All right. So we've got that in there. I'm going to add in some light tahini. And I'm gonna use about a tablespoon I'm eyeballing here. And really we're just gonna use this to drizzle over, over everything. Now you may see the tahini kind of curdle or not curdle, but kind of split with the lemon juice. You can use a little, little whisk and whisk it together like that. And you may notice with tahini that when you add in lemon juice, it starts to thicken quite quickly. So it's gonna be quite a thick paste. You can also add in a little bit of water if you'd like to stretch it out. I'm just gonna add in more lemon juice because I really like that flavor and I find that it balances the fattiness of that tahini, but you know, not everybody's a lemon fanatic like I am. So a little bit of water can also. You can also add in a little bit of olive oil. I just find the fat from the tahini is enough for this top. So we have any questions while I'm squeezing the lemon. <laughs> Hopefully everybody has some food to snack on while you're watching this. So now that I have that extra lemon juice, you can see that that consistency has become a lot more pourable. So that's great. I'm also gonna add in a pinch of salt. So from here, we've got a lot of our components ready to go. So we've got some toasted walnuts. I've got cooked chickpeas. I've got a tahini dressing. I've got my greens, my beets, and we'll very shortly have our sweet potatoes and our farro. So from here, I'm going to grab my plate, nice, nice big lunch plate. And we're gonna check in on our things. So it's still cooking away. I'm gonna turn up that heat just a little bit. And our sweet potatoes, coming out. They started to get beautifully golden brown, ready to go. I don't want them to be too dark. So by the time our farro is fully cooked, our sweet potatoes will have cooled down a little bit and we'll be ready to, to go. Um, Joyce just asked, best things to replace the beets with if they aren't your thing, which is totally cool. So instead of the beets, what you could do, um, particularly during the fall, is think about other fall veggies or fruits. So you could do some apples. There are some beautiful apple orchards in the Ohio, Northern Kentucky area. So that would be a really beautiful 
thing to add to this dish. Also add some crunch factor to the dish as well. You could also do something like carrots. Now with the carrots, you can absolutely roast them or what you could do is you could uh, keep them raw or you could even pickle them. So tons of different methods. And really you wanna think about how all the flavors kind of interact with each other, but also the textures. So I'm gonna take my gloves off really quickly and just see if, we, if I missed any other questions. I haven't yet. So, um, but beets, yeah, you could totally switch it out for other root veggies or something completely different like apples or pears and things like that. Aha, uh -huh. and another question, best seasoning for butternut squash. I love it. So um, butternut squash is amazing and it pairs really well with a lot of different spices and herbs. So I find that I love it, particularly with thyme, sage, rosemary, some of those heartier herbs that are really perfect during the fall. Or you can also do spices like cinnamon, or you can do something like even cumin and coriander. It's not the, the first thought most people will think of, but it is really lovely with butternut squash along with chili powder. I love it. And making soup. So sometimes with making butternut soup or butternut squash soup, sometimes there's, um, feels like it may be missing something. Sometimes that can be uh, drawn towards the, the stock that you used. So how much flavor the stock was bringing to that recipe. It could be that it needs a little bit more salts, but other spices that are really great with butternut squash soup includes ginger and garlic as well. So sometimes adding those in, sometimes if I'm feeling really fancy, I'll um, add a, use a little bit of apple cider as well instead of my veggie stock or do a combination of veggie stock and apple cider. So hopefully that helps with your soup. Beautiful. Almost there. I'm just impatient. Even chefs are impatient with, with cooking. How does everybody feel about knife work, meal prepping? Are those strong suits for everybody or is this something that's a little daunting? Love it. I love it. I love hearing that. All right, we got, I'm a beginner, which is awesome. We all have to start somewhere, which is super important. Ah, and we just got a question, what is your favorite knife to use? So um, the knife I'm using today is a Miyabi, uh, but honestly, any sharp knife that feels comfortable in your hands is what you should use. So I've used a lot of different knives over my career. And as a person, um, Wusthof is a really great brand as well. Uh, some chefs are very particular about the maker and also the type of steel used. My thing mostly is if you can go to a store and try out different sizes because there are knives that are like six inches versus eight inches. If you've got really large hands, they even have 10 inches. So you, you, know, you can have a larger knife or a smaller knife. My hands are quite small. It's probably pretty apparent on camera even. Uh, so I go for usually a seven to eight inch chef's knife. I get a lot of dexterity and movement with it, um, but I don't want something too big where it feels unwieldy. Um, but they do also make like six, four, like five, six inch knives, which are great particularly for like teenagers. So, wow, we got a lot of, we got a lot of messages now. I love it. All right. Ah, Joyce put, I'm scared of rhubarb. How is it prepared? That's a great question. So rhubarb is lovely and tart and amazing, but can be very daunting because essentially it's like this large stem. So what you can do, uh, lots of different ways to prepare it. You can roast it which is a lovely way to get that flavor, but the texture changes pretty substantially. So what you could arguably also do is you could use something like a veggie peeler and cut it into strips and keep it raw. I'd recommend not eating too much raw of rhubarb just because it can be quite intense and not everybody's tummy loves it, uh, but you could do that or you could quick pickle it as well. Um, some people will also poach it. Poach rhubarb is very classic, particularly for desserts, um, but you could absolutely do that savory as well with a little veggie stock. So hopefully that helps. Ah, we got a question. Good alternatives for olive oil. Uh, exactly. It's got a great taste, but low smoke point. So when we're doing something with high heat, we want to try and go for other oils. So safflower oil can be very helpful for that. For that. Uh, coconut oil can be really great as well. I tend to stay away from vegetable oil just because it's like, like an amalgamation of different veggie oils, but at the same time, it does have a higher smoke point. So typically I go for safflower oil or coconut oil, depending on what I'm doing and also the flavor. Now, depending on the type of olive oil you're using as well, extra virgin has a very, very low smoke point, great for salads and that flavor, 
but you can get a little bit more processed oil or olive oils that can withstand heat a little bit more. So just regular olive oil or um, virgin olive oil rather than extra virgin. So there are different gradients too. So hopefully that helps Stephen. Any ideas for on the go healthy breakfast? That's an excellent question. And when we're thinking about breakfast, it can sometimes depend on your preferences or family's preferences. Personally, I actually really like cold oats. So I soak my oats overnight and then I have them in cute little mason jars. I add a little bit of nuts um, or granola on the top in the morning so that that has that nice crunch and it's not soggy, uh, but it's not for everybody. So sometimes making like um, breakfast bars can be a really great way to introduce a lot of whole grains and some dried fruit without going over on the sweetness. So sometimes those are my go-to, but some people love smoothies as well. You can kind of pre-package them in your freezer, just the whole veggies and whole fruit from there in the morning. Um, pour it into your blender and add in, you know, your, if you want to do totally plant-based almond milk or soy milk or something like that, or if you do dairy, totally fine too. Add that in, blend it up, and you're on your way. So you can always prep that out in advance as well. Awesome. I love that meal prepping. Do you know the pharaoh is cooked when the water is gone? Yeah, pretty much that's what we're actually going to check right now. So that's a great question, Molly. So I've taken my heat off most of the water is gone. You can see that the farrow has kind of gotten nice and plump as well. But what we need to do, check it by texture. And it's nice and tender. It's still got a little bit of a chewiness to it. So we don't want it to be soft and mushy, but we do want a little bit of texture there. So we've got everything ready to go. So we're gonna plate up and I know we're really close on time. So we're gonna speed beam in this. <laughs> so at this point, I'm gonna take my whole grains. If you do have excess liquid and it's tender, you can strain that out. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate this down so everybody can see my setup. I'm going to put my whole grains in the middle of my bowl. And you can honestly cool this all the way down if you want the cold salad or if you wanted to prep it in advance and you're taking it to work, totally can do that too. So, so I've got my farro there. And from here, I'm going to add in our sweet potatoes onto the plate. I'm gonna use my hands, but you could actually use tongs as well. But what I'm going to do is add my veggies around the farro so we have some beautiful color on there as well, but you could honestly mix this all together if you really wanted to. So from here, I'm gonna add in some of my beets because I do not have those single use gloves on anymore and I do not want red hands for the whole day. Can add those to the dish as well from here. And I'm just thinking about how the colors are kind of pairing. So I'm gonna add in my chickpeas, about a half a cup. You can always add more or less. And then from here, some of my beet greens. You could also season the greens with a little bit of olive oil and salt. If you're doing this dish in advance though, I highly recommend not dressing your greens until right before you go to eat it. And then from here, we're gonna take some of our dressing and just drizzle it on. So when we go to mix it up to eat it, all the flavors come together. And then from here, I'm just going to finish it off with some of my toasted walnuts on top, just to add in some crunch and some healthy fats and voila. We are set. So you can do this in advance, absolutely. What I do recommend though, if you're taking it to the office, is separating out your components so that you don't have sad wilty greens or kind of sad walnuts that are, or other nuts too, or seeds if you prefer, can't have nuts. Um, you just don't want them to be sad and lose their, their texture. So that's our dish for the day. And I, I know we just had tons of messages come through. So hopefully we've gotten to most of the questions. Any recommendations for dressing that go well with this bowl? So the tahini dressing, or you could do something like a lemon olive oil vinaigrette. Um, you can absolutely do something a little bit more kind of bodacious and, and do like a silken tofu kind of ranch as well, if you'd prefer. I'm not that type of person, but I like to go with classic vinaigrettes, but I hope that helps. Awesome. I love that everybody's adding in suggestions too about breakfast items. 
Um, and then Robin asked, I missed the tip on the olive oil. How much oil did you recommend for the onion? Um, for this dish, I, I used about two teaspoons for the quantity of farro that we made. Um, but depending on how much you're making, you basically just want to coat the bottom of your pot so that the onions can start to soften uh, and have that heat transfer. Avocado oil, absolutely you know we are talking about oils. Avocado oil is phenomenal. Totally recommend that as well. I love that everybody chimed in, it's awesome. Uh, Molly, Ashley, I know we are very short on time, uh, so I wanna pass it back to you okay. if you need to. No, it's okay. We have um, some buffer time um, if you would like to address the other questions. I know there were a couple more in the chat, um, yeah. so I I'll let you do that and we can wrap up. Awesome, so I think the last one I got um, that, unless I missed some others, which um, please let me know if I have, is recommendations on health store bought dressings. Um, typically, I, I personally like to really make dressings at home because they can be very simple, few ingredients, and you can make a large batch. So like this tahini dressing, you can absolutely make a large batch of it and then just shake it up before you need it. Uh, I find that that way um, you reduce the amount of processed ingredients that you're consuming. Um, and then from there too, you can, you know, use wheel and deal as you need. Um, but if you're, you're definitely like, no, I don't have the time, um, I don't personally have brands that I really attach to when it comes to dressings, but what I would recommend, read the label, see how many extra ingredients there are in their stabilizers to see, um, to see what's in it before you decide to buy it. So I, I hope that helps a little bit. And we have one more question. How long do homemade dressings keep? Really important question, um, typically about a week. Um, I tend to not keep them longer just because it, things start to separate. And when we're thinking about food safety, the standard serve safe, probably questionable is after seven days. Also, please make sure to refrigerate it. But if you have something like um, apple cider vinegar and olive oil and a little bit of you know dried thyme in it, that's gonna keep longer because there aren't any perishable items really in it besides the thyme. And you can you could even use dried thyme and then it has an extended life. So use your best judgment, but if you've used fresh ingredients in it, I'd say max seven days. And Joyce asked, you need to rinse all grains or only rice. So uh, grains like quinoa can also be quite bitter. So I do recommend rinsing that as well. Um, rinsing is a good practice, particularly because of how grains are stored and things like that. So I say, go for it. Um, the only time you don't really wanna wash your grains is if you're making something like, our, like risotto, uh, because you want all that starchy goodness that's on the rice uh, to help make that beautifully creamy, dreamy dish. So arborio rice is pretty much the one rice I do not use, or grain I don't rinse. Awesome. Uh, what was the bottle of dressing? Just tahini, that is an excellent question. So this is just from a local Kroger and I got my beet hands all over it, but it's just tahini. So it's ground sesame seeds. You can also make this by scratch in a high speed blender or in a mortar and pestle, but if somebody's doing it for you, I think that's okay. <laughs> and I love the note, Brenda, about uh, doing a small dice apple and cooking a microwave with oatmeal. That's awesome. It's a beautiful breakfast item too. And I think I hit everybody's questions. Yes, thank you so much. Very special thank you to Dr. Chef Stephanie Michaelak White for sharing your expertise and time with us today. I know that looks delicious. So hopefully uh, we can all try our best to prepare that the same way at home. But also thank you all so much for tuning in to the Plant-Based Power Hour healthy lunch meal prep session. Um, you can share your thoughts on today's event and session um, with the brief survey linked in the chat. As another friendly reminder, um, the BYUC team will send an email after the event about session materials, BYUC points, a feedback survey, and any additional opportunities to continue being the change. But Chef Stephanie, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. and. Um, that's all we have. Thank you all for being here with me. Hopefully you make some beautiful grain bowls yourself and have a great rest of your day. Really appreciated your time.